Hello ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to VUX World, the Practical Voice Podcast. This episode of VUX World is brought to you by Botmock, the best way to design your voice experiences. If you're still using, you know, post-it notes or, um, you know, sketch or you're using kind of other kind of prototyping manual effort sort of like tools, um, or if you're getting straight into the code, and this episode we're going to talk about the perils of getting straight into the code without thinking thinking about the design first. If you're if you're doing that then you should really check out Botmock. It is a fantastic design tool where you can design things like Alexa skills and Google Actions. You can collaborate with your team within the platform. You can go all the way through to develop a handover. There's templates in there. You can preview and test it. It's it's a, an absolutely fantastic tool. Check it out. You can check it out for free if you go to botmock.com/vuxworld. That is Botmock, B-O-T-M-O-C-K dot com slash V-U-X world. Check it out. Thank you, Botmock. On today's episode, we speak to Hans Van Dam, the founder of Robocopy. Uh, Robocopy are a conversational design agency and a conversation design training company. They've got a course at conversationalacademy.com uh, and it's they are training people to be conversation designers. Now, you might be thinking, what's so difficult about conversation design? You just put some words on a piece of paper and away you go. In actual fact, as you'll find out in this episode, there is so much to conversation design. It is absolutely unbelievable. We get into some supreme detail. Essentially, you're probably getting a preview of the course in this episode because Hans shares so many tips and so many insights that will help you on your conversation design journey. There's things in there around understanding the technology. There's things in there around understanding and using psychology. And there's things in there around copywriting and what the differences are between writing for the page versus writing for voice. Uh, there's things in there around persona design. There's, we talk about some of the mistakes that people make when it comes to conversation design. Uh, and it's honestly, it is jam packed full of insights. Get your pens and your pads out because this one is absolutely immense. And without further ado, this is VUX World. Well, Hans, thank you for joining us. Anyway, let's let's jump into this then. Like, it's it's a pleasure for you to join us uh, all the way from the Netherlands. I say all the way from the Netherlands. It's it's kind of feels like it's up the road, really. But yeah, welcome welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Thank so, you for having me. No problem, not a problem at all. We are delighted to to have you. And obviously, I'm joined by Dustin Court as always. Afternoon, Dustin. Hey, Kane. How's it been going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been one of them weeks, hasn't it? This week. <laughs> it's been a mental week our baby had his injections at the beginning of the week and he wasn't best pleased about that so he was kind of first night in a while he was up in the middle of the night so it was a bit of a, a bit of a time in one Monday night but yeah Hans tell us a little bit about Robocopy it's I've, you know I've been having a play around and a poke about on there and it's looking like a, a really interesting concept tell us tell uh, the listeners of VUX World what Robocopy is all about yeah, so Robocopy, we pretty much write dialogue that makes chatbots and voice assistants more helpful, natural, and persuasive when they talk to users. Um, so we're not a tech company at all. Uh, what we see is that there's just a lot of tech companies in the market, and they're all sort of selling hammers. And we're the only company in the world right now that's sort of training carpenters and is actually, you know, building stuff that that's creating value. So we really try to focus on, you know, uh, recognizing conversation design as a new job and trying to create methods around that and really exploring what it means to be a conversation designer is, you know, what are the skills that you need? Um, what do you need to focus on? And it's really a combination of understanding technology, understanding copywriting and understanding psychology. So we try to bring together those three uh, elements and, and really design a method around that that is going to help uh, conversation designers create better conversational experiences. Mm. And it's a, it's kind of like, what is it? Is it like an online course? Is it sort of like uh, video tutorials, one-to-one kind of things? How does it all work? Yeah, that's, so there's two parts of, uh, of Robocopy. There's the agency that we started out with, mm-hmm. uh, and we were just really doing our own projects and, and hiring people. And then I wrote a blog post that said, you know, we train our own people in the conversational academy. And um, 
then everybody wanted in. So everybody started emailing me as like, oh yeah, we need that training. Uh, so yeah, we figured we, we have to do something with that. So we've now created a uh, conversational academy.com and people can go there and uh, really follow an online course. So we start with webinars and we're now working really hard in the studio to uh, really put together a online video course where People can just, you know, self-study and do little tests and write dialogues and get feedback. And uh, at the end of it, they can become a certified conversation designer. Nice. So there's the course then. And then, so in terms of the other work that you do on the on the agency side with RoboCopy, is that kind of, is that where you would go out into uh, working with clients to train them up? Or do you do the kind of dialogue writing and the conversation design on their behalf? How does the other side of it work? Yeah, so it's usually a combination of the two. So there's a lot of companies that what happens is they somebody went to the office and they said, I have technology for you. It's brilliant. It's called artificial intelligence, and you just plug it in, and then you're going to have a beautiful chatbot or voice experience, right? <laughs> and so they've all invested in the technology, and then they discovered that it doesn't work that way and that it's actually very complicated to create good interactions. Um, so they bring us in and most projects that we do is uh, we start by, by scanning what's already there, rewriting that, but then also very quickly transferring knowledge to them. So it's a combination of sort of first being in the lead and doing the work, writing the dialogue and then training their team to do it themselves. And that we usually stay involved uh, just for editorial purposes and, and sort of making sure that the quality is actually up to par. And uh, so it's a combination of both training and doing the actual work. Mm. What, what mistakes do you see most often when you go in there and you take a look at what they've already done? Um, the, the main problem that everybody's doing, uh, that everybody's facing is that they think every, when they design dialogue, they start with the technology and they create a flow chart and sort of trying to figure out what users want and then they start with the limitations and or end capabilities of the technology as opposed to really you know having the empathy in there and understanding the context of the user so what you want to do is really write you know what does the user want to achieve and then you just role play and create sample dialogue and uh you know you you go from there so you fine tune that sample dialogue and that's going to be you know uh what you're going to be working with so the technology should really be the last part of it and it's the same as like if you go build a house you you don't just go build, go buy you know equipment you're going to talk to the architect first mm -hmm. um so i feel that that's sort of the issue when you have a, a problem in the customer journey uh you need to sort of have a conversational mindset as to how to solve that problem and, and understand those principles as opposed to just diving into your platform and sort of you know trying to build something because then it's always like very static and very transactional very robotic it's usually like a developer that wrote a copy um so yeah they, they it's completely backwards i think you know if you sum it all up what's the what's the issue it's completely backwards to start with technology but they should start with user and psychology mm. is that like would you say that that's people being kind of like too keen to jump in and sort of get the hands dirty and play around with it without kind of thinking about what the experience should look like first. Is that what the symptom is, do you think, or, or not? Uh, yeah, I think, I think the, the, you know, internal with most businesses, the, the conversation started around technology. Uh, you know, that's what people are excited about. You know, that's how these projects start is that, you know, we have a customer service department, how are we going to automate it? Yeah, you know, well, we're going to need technology for that. So it, I, I understand that they're starting with that, and they don't know that they need someone that, that has the experience of being a conversation designer. They don't even know that it's a job yet. Um, so so it's definitely, I, c I can see them going wrong, you know, taking the wrong angle there. And right now you do see that there's companies, you know, that are stepping into it now. They they are a bit more uh, educated around this topic already. So they understand that, that conversation design is important because most people not, like there's now plenty of voice experiences around that everybody knows what a bad experience is. Um, 
so they understand that they don't want to be the company with the bad experiences so they they look beyond technology a bit more now that's that's one trend that you do see now hmm. who's who's usually writing the this copy and is that the person who should be or in this company for the wrong uh, that, that's a good question. Usually what happens, you know, every company has a, knows how to build a product, right? So they have UX designers and they have developers, front end, back end. They have that whole little circus. Uh, so when they start building a conversational experience, what they do is they just take that same process. And that process is, you know, you do a bit of research, somebody create, you know, UX designer makes a flow chart. Uh, and then ultimately, like, they have the whole thing set up. And then, you know, it's like a flow chart with Laura Mips in it. And then they just get, like, the, the web editor or the content writer or just a regular traditional copywriter. And they just say, yeah, we need some works for this. Can you please do that? Um, so that do those are usually the people like a good com like a bad company. It's actually the developer that wrote the copy. Uh, the better companies it's usually like a content editor, or maybe like someone that's you know that's writing the blogs and mm. you know somebody that does something with words, mm. um, as opposed to someone that is is really trained, uh, you know, in, in understanding the technology. Uh, you know, bots and humans. This is how, this is how we see the world, right? Bots and humans are going to be living together and they're going to be working together. Um, that can only happen if they learn how to communicate with each other. So for us, chatbots and voice assistants, that's just the first step in that big trend. Uh, so they need to learn how to communicate. And that's really difficult because they have completely different brains, right? One has an artificial brain and it needs structured data. Uh, natural language understanding takes care of that. Um, but then if you want to have a good conversation, then natural language creation should be equally important as natural language understanding. And the brain of a human needs completely different input than an artificial brain. So we need empathy and guidance and encouragement and those kind of things. So when we design conversations, uh, we need to write that in there. We need to understand how we motivate a user to have him continue with the conversation. We need to understand what his doubts are and what his information needs are and you know what's behind the question behind the question. Uh, so if you have expertise of only copywriting and or only technology, then you're never going to uh, uh, sufficiently adhere to that part of the human brain. And so all your interactions are not going to go anywhere. Um, so a conversation designer really needs to understand like the capabilities and limitation of the artificial brain and the capabilities and limitations of the human brain. And, and that's why you need to understand all three things, you know, uh, technology, psychology, and copywriting. And um, so this is for voice assistants. I mean, it's a great first step, and it's great that there's a lot of traction in the market. But, you know, if we ever want to live and work with robots, you know, more intimately and more effectively, then we really need to focus on designing these conversations better. Mm. Hmm. I'm interested to to delve into them three areas of technology, psychology, and and copywriting because it's uh, it's it's interesting what you're saying in terms of um, you know you need to obviously understand the technology so that you know what it's capable of. Um, so what is what is some of the we'll start with the technology. What's some of the things about the current technology that we, that will influence? your conversation design, whether that's limitations, whether it's challenges, whether it's opportunities, what are some of the things around the current technology that would influence your your conversation yeah. design? Yeah, so if you look at AI right now, right, and, and mainly we're, we look at for natural language understanding, that's like the only thing where it's really useful right now. Um, AI works when you have a limited scope. And so if you design, you know, even your introduction, like for a voice assistant, if I say, ask me a question, then you can ask me any question. <laughs> but if I say, ask me a question about coffee, then the odds of you asking me a question about coffee really increase. Um, so when you look at, you know, the, the current state of the technology and the AI, we actually need to use... Uh, psychology and framing to influence the user in such a way that he's going to give me, that he's going to say stuff 
that I can then understand. Um, so right now, it's really important. Also, uh, you know, if you look, you know, how does a, a how does your perso bot persona relate to your user? It's important to have them a bit higher in uh, higher in hierarchy because that allows them to be more proactive and take more control of the conversation and sort of guiding him through the process as opposed to being a very servant and obedient bot persona that is going to be more reactive. Because uh, mm -hmm. if you're going to be more reactive in your conversation design, then you're going to depend too much on technology. So by being, you know, uh, really proactive and guiding the user, you're going to limit the scope of the AI and that is going to allow your AI to function better. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at you know, the development that we're going to have in this market is that AI is going to get smarter. So that is going to allow us to be more flexible in that regard. Um, but we still need to find those crucial spots where we know that we're going to need a certain input from a user and really uh, make sure that we influence him in such a way that we're going to get exactly what we need. Mm. Interesting. That's it. Seems to be the recurring theme around the the trying to limit the technology, and I like what you're saying around framing framing the the kind of experience. What's what? I mean, that's that's kind of reminiscent of the kind of nudge theory, isn't it? You know, the is it Cass Sustain and and um, can't remember the other chap's name now. Um, but what what other um, sort of psychological uh, things come into play. Obviously, we've got framing, which helps to sort of narrow the scope of the experience. Um, what other sort of psychological either traits or what, what, how, how else does psychology kind of play a role in in the conversation design? Yeah, um, yeah. So what we when we design a dialogue, we start at first with like how motivated is our user. So if a user has a certain issue or a problem he wants to solve then you know he's going to be motivated so we can keep our dialogue rather transactional if my user is not very motivated because maybe i'm trying to sell him something you know or i'm trying to let, get him to leave a review or anything like that uh, then i'm going to have to be more persuasive and um, there is a, a very elaborate toolkit of copywriting techniques that we can use to really, uh, you know, influence him. So we, you know, for psychology, we can use uh, uh, social proof. We can use a sense of urgency. Uh, we can do expectation management. It's all these little elements that we can put into conversation design. So we at Robocopy, there's a lot of psychologists on our team obviously, uh, and they design the escalation prevention model. Uh, so that's a framework where, you know, for customer service more, where you can say, you know, it's like negative emotions like anger and fear, um, and they can lead to undesired behavior. Uh, so someone that's like very angry can maybe, you know, become revengeful and leave bad reviews or, or post bad messages on your Facebook wall. Um, so then there's like a whole pattern of psychology and, and copywriting techniques that you can use to keep that uh, to prevent that undesired behavior from happening um, so you know we want to be very clear we want to apologize want to address his feelings um, and these are all like little elements that you can put in there um, to make sure that you, that you just guide him through the process we, uh, when we design conversations, we've, we've created the bot scorecard that allows us to evaluate every dialogue based on like personality, natural language, empathy, helpfulness, and persuasiveness. So whenever we, and under each category, you have like a full toolkit of copywriting techniques that you can use. And all that copywriting technique is all psychology-based, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so every time you design something, you can use that framework for yourself to make sure that you know you check all the boxes and you have everything in there. But it's also great for like giving your colleagues feedback on what they're doing. So maybe you, can, you know maybe there's not enough empathy in there. Uh, mm -hmm. That's always a big one. So it, it will sort of show if you use that framework. It's like okay, there, there's not enough of that in there. So you, you use these and these principles um, to create a better experience. So there, yeah, there's like we have about fifty different copywriting principles in our toolkit that we teach in the academy that you can then use. Mm. 
Um, it's Richard Thaler, who's the other author of that book, Nudge. Ah. Castestina, Richard Thaler, that's it. Um, I'm glad you Googled that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to leave it hanging because it's a really, really good book and I recommend anyone read it. If you're still writing code uh, to design and test your chatbot's conversational experience, then you should check out Botmock. Uh, it's the smartest way to design and prototype conversational apps. So if you're using things like you know mind maps and process maps and whiteboards, or if you're getting straight into the code to try and build some stuff, um, or if you're using things like Sketch to try and build sort of prototypes in, then 100% check out Botmock. You know, it's, it's companies of all sizes are using it, small companies, large companies. Uh, you can build Alexa skills in there and it'll save you hours because you can actually collaborate with your whole team while you're designing your thing. It's, uh, you know, even down to the, handing it over to developers. The whole thing is a, is a huge collaboration tool. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Do check it out. You can try Botmock for free at botmock.com slash V-U-X world. That's B-O-T-M-O-C-K dot com slash V-U-X world. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting that because I was going to um, I was going to ask the follow up question was going to be how do you measure it? So the, you know, online, for example, if you use something like um, there's a concept in there, isn't it, around anchoring? So if you uh-huh. let's say, for example, yeah. if if you present somebody with uh, a numbered ball, I think there's some studies where you present someone that with a numbered ball, like a bingo ball that says eighty nine on it, and then you ask them to guess the price of a bottle of wine. And if it's a premium bottle of wine, they're likely to kind of bid higher than if you give them the number twenty one on the bingo ball, for example. So you've, you've anchored their kind of train of thought on on the number. So uh-huh. and you can kind of you can measure that stuff online because for example if you are uh, i don't know a charity and you're requesting a donation you can use a bit of social proof and say most people donate 30 pounds so you've kind of you've used a bit of social proof you've anchored it at 30 pound maybe you'll get 15 pound but it's more than you if you'd have just left it open and you might get a fiver so there's kind of and you can you can split test that and you can do multivariate testing so you can sort of prove how your messaging is impacting things uh-huh. uh, is there a way of, of doing the same kind of detailed testing in in voice and in conversation design? Is that what the bot scorecard does, or is there another way that you can actually do some empirical uh, testing on it? No, it, it, like the bot scorecard is really like a reference framework for yourself and also to have arguments to management, etc. cetera. Okay. Uh, what you can do, however, you know, uh, so, so what sort of s- separates our mythology from other approaches is that you have a argument for everything you do. And if you have an argument for everything you do, your data is going to make some sense, right? Mm-hmm. So if you have a complete like decision tree uh, and you see where the drop-offs are, uh, you want an A-B test there. That's what you always do, obviously. Um, but then you can also, in this terms, like if you've written out the whole thing, you have arguments for every sentence that you've written. Uh, you can then create a test so you can say you know social proof worked better or we're now doing social proof uh maybe we should try anchoring Mm -hmm. and run a run a bit of a split test there so um as opposed to just you know changing the words you can uh really change the principle and have an a b test on that um so that that's the stuff that that we're looking into of of doing that more Mm -hmm. um with voice it's it's a bit different still than with chatbots because you're going to have more stuff to work with mm-hmm. uh, for these a b tests it, it makes more sense to have visual clues like buttons etc so when you now have the voice and the screen you can do it better mm-hmm. uh, so that's opening a lot of room for for optimization but uh yeah you can a b test certain principles versus each other so that's that's mm-hmm. definitely a, an option Mm. And would you do that in a kind of like a pre, um, like in the design phase, like before things went live? Or I don't know if there's, if there's, and maybe Dustin, you might know about this as well, either whether there's these kind of facilities in Google Assistant or Alexa. Is there any kind of multivariate testing or anything like that within them platforms at the moment? Or is this all what you would do before you kind of put it onto those platforms? I think a lot of that's still needs to develop i'm not too familiar with alexa actually uh, uh, what we we do everything with google right now okay. uh, but i think a lot of that stuff is going to come from third party mm. platforms uh and, i mean we usually go 
uh, we with your voss testing that mm -hmm. that's the quickest way obviously of doing that quick and dirty um, so what we do so if we have a dialogue you know there's going to be like technical requirements and there's going to be like emotional requirements right mm -hmm. uh, so if, if I need to change the address you know I'm going to need the current address and you know all the parameters new address then I need going to need a confirmation and verification of the user so those are sort of the needs that the bot has and at the same time like the human the emotional needs are going to be like you know we need to address a certain uh, amount of uncertainty about whether my mail is going to go to the right address and i need to make sure there's sort of needs to be you know we need to address that and you know there's it's completely different so the user and the bot both have like their little list of requirements okay. uh, so when you do the sample dialogue um you know sample dialogue is really you know rule playing so, you know, you're going to say, okay, you're going to change your address. How does that conversation flow? And you just play it out. And uh, if that works, like if you can have a natural conversation and role play, and you've sort of checked all the boxes, both the technical requirements and the emotional requirements, then you know you've got something that you can develop. Mm. So that's like your first uh, proof of concept, really. And then you fine-tune that. You polish the cop. You put in like the good psychological principles there and then you do a wizard of Oz test or well, you could already do an a b test there mm. uh but you know so and then you do that so that gives you like a good detailed conversation design then you reference that with the bot scorecard to make sure that you check all those boxes and then you go live so then you already have a very polished version of whatever you're putting out there um and then you can always, I think now, like most A-B tests around voice are really just, you know, put this one live for a week and put the other one live for a week and see which one does better. Mm. Uh, but we'll see more advanced uh, apps for that in the future, I'm sure. Yeah. Have you come across anything, Dustin, or ever done any, any of that sort of stuff on Alexa or Google? No, I, I haven't done any testing. I'm sure there's certainly tooling out there, right? It could be as simple as putting it into a database and, and connecting it to some analytics, uh, but I haven't seen any specific tooling. But I would be surprised if that's not uh, if we don't see that in a year, right? Uh, if we don't see that matur maturation in terms of tracking and analytics and testing uh, based on these principles. Mm. So on the on the, it's interesting what you were saying there, Han, around the um, the what you call it, the Wizard of Oz testing. So. All you know, it's 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 almost kind of like similar to a, a usability study, isn't it? So if you were testing a website, you would have one person sat there, and you would be having the you know the website in front of them, and you're kind of you're studying their reactions, you're studying what they're doing. But you know, yes, you're empathising with them, and the whole point of that is is to empathise with them. Um, but I've never really come across anyone who has a specific checklist for how they intend the user to to feel emotionally that's a unique that's a unique perspective on me that one so is it is it literally as much as that you kind of for every sort of phrase or for every kind of element of the conversation you would say well this is how we want people to react this is how we want them to feel and this is the emotions we want to convey sort of thing uh, i think there's that's a good question uh, there, i think there's two sides to it sometimes i need to uh, have emotional stuff in there to make sure that you have a good experience um, but oftentimes I need to put certain things in there to keep you motivated to continue with the conversation okay. right so if um, so some so it has two functions in a way um, so so it's I mean it's not it's, it's you know if, if you would then sort of rank the emotion that someone has obviously it's, it doesn't work like that mm -hmm. but you do need like okay i have users with this problem and i know how i can solve it technically but the obstacle is that it's going to take five steps right. and that's your big problem and then uh then you just got to be you know very conscious of, of what you can put in there if it's a long process you need to sort of activate them and, and you know you need to increase their motivation well you know one way of doing that is like having small little questions that they can say yes to at the start people like saying yes uh so you know if you sort of activate them like okay i'm going to ask you five questions it's going to take a while but 
when you're going to, we're going to pull through, are you ready? And, you know, your user says, yes. Are you sure? Yes. Then they say yes two times in a row. That is really going to increase their motivation. And that's going to allow you to walk them through the steps. Also, if you have interactions where you're going to need personal data, you don't, ask for that in your first question. So you do the simple questions first, you get them committed to the process, and that's when you come with the more difficult questions. So uh, it, it's not necessary. I mean, yeah, if you say, like, what's the emotion that I want to get out of this one sentence? It is to increase motivation, but it's never uh, to sort of, you know, have more subtle labels that you can put on there, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. That, that's kind of some Tony Robbins shit, that isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. I am your guru. <laughs> you know, get them saying yes a few times before and get them feeling positive and, and get them motoring on. That's yeah, yeah. Yeah, but if there's a reason he's successful and it's psychology and it works and that's the that's the thing with all these characters that you design also with tone of voice. Uh, you know, it's based on, on, on stereotypes and it's based on patterns, mm. uh, but it's a reason they're stereotypes because it's the truth and it works. And sure, there's like thousands of exceptions to all those rules. Uh, but, you know, if 80% of your users, if it's going to work for them, then you got to do it. Mm. It's the same thing with... Um, a lot of companies are now, you know, when you design a persona for a voice experience... They all they don't want to pick a side. They want they don't want to have it be a man or a woman. They all want it to be gender neutral, uh, which in the political climate makes sense, uh, but it's not going to make sense in terms of psychology and even biology, um, right? Because if you hear a voice within like one second, you're sort of projecting and inferring a persona from it, right? Mm. Uh, so based on the tone and the speech and the speed and the vocabulary, uh, you're going to think, oh, this is, you know, like a 40-year-old guy that is uh, highly educated that lives in London or whatever. Mm. Uh, you always, when you hear a voice, your brain automatically within a second sees a man or a woman. And humans don't have a gender-neutral the recognition, like nobody recognizes uh, a gender neutral vocabulary. Um, so, so being politically correct and, and having a gender neutral voice experience uh, is just not going to resonate with your user. And if you have so few visual clues, none, if it's just only the voice, you don't want to take that risk. So you want to make sure that you have an experience that, you know, is going to really get into their brain the way it's wired and that you know similarity is really important with voice experience so if you have a lot of male users you want to have a male persona uh because their brain is wired that way uh the upside's true as well you know a lot of female users you probably want a female persona and a female vocabulary uh so if you would yeah obviously if you would have like millions of gender neutral users <laughs> it might make sense to sort of have a gender neutral persona uh but you gotta make a decision and behind the scenes, like you can say to your, you know, in, in the media and marketing, you can say, you know, it's a, it's a gender neutral thing. But when you're designing for it, it needs to be either one mm. or you need to be very experienced and very aware of all the risks that you're doing. Mm. Like, you know, female women speak more in terms of like we and, and you know, uh, in terms of people and men are generally a bit more rational in the words that they choose. Mm. Uh there's obviously a lot of gray area and stereotypes are there to be broken, but it's definitely as a voice designer, something that you need to be aware of and, and, and know how to maneuver around. Mm. I think that's one of the things that Kathy Pearl mentions is that um, I'll put the link to a book. Maybe that in the show notes. It's a really good, really good read on um, design and voice experiences. It's that essentially whether, whether you design a persona or not, your user will craft one anyway. You've just said there, yeah. Hans, that, that whatever, as soon as someone listens, hears something, they'll think, oh, it's a 40-year-old male or whatever. So if they're going to do that anyway, then you may as well sort of design a persona. Is that is that? Would you concur? And, and do you go through the process of persona design as well? Yeah, yeah, no, but it's, it's definitely true. If you have thousands of users, 
and you're not designing a persona that means you have a thousand different personas mm -hmm. uh, so you want to take control you want to take control of that process so you got to go very really deep with that research and really look at it you know uh, you know what's what's what are the brand values what are the users what are the users trying to achieve how do they feel when they want to achieve that uh, how do we relate to the users are, are we you know are we a custom service agent are we an advisor or are we like a coach you know are we their peers are we above them or are we below them how do we relate to each other uh, but also you got to create background story for your users like what's their or uh, for your persona so it's not you know, like your bot persona is not just an extension of your brand it's something in relation to your brand and to your user uh, so you can't just have your style guide and, and sort of fast forward that to to your conversation design so you need to know like what are the hobbies of your persona how old are they where were they educated who are their friends uh what personally motivates them um like really the way you would craft a character for a movie or a book uh that's how you want to craft a, a bot persona as well and you got to focus really on the on the psychology and how it relates to the user so you do that and then you build like a standard vocabulary around them so how would they like have certain phrases how would they respond in this situation or what's like a very you know cane way of saying things right uh so, so you got to really make it come to life. And also, if like if you worked off text to speech, then uh, it doesn't matter uh, that much for this point that I'm making. But if you have like a voice actor or just a regular actor that's going to do your voice, having that very detailed character is also going to help them uh, bring out the voice. Uh, so it's going to create a consistent experience for everyone that's going to. Uh, interact with it, but also for all uh, you know, all the copywriters they're going to be working on it. They're going to sort of have the tools and, and the context of, of how they should talk. Um, so yeah, persona is key. If you don't have a persona, then there's no point to designing a dialogue. Mm -hmm. And would at, at what point would you say that this is really necessary? Uh, you know, I think some people might be hearing this and go. I can barely get approval for a single dev to work on my on my experience. How am I going to devote all the resources to this? Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a good point. Now, I think you can do, sort of do you can do a quick persona. Like we have uh, we have companies where you know they are a bit reluctant. Should we really pre you know we still want to we're in the experimental phase. Uh, there is no point in doing like six months research into a persona, uh, which I wouldn't suggest. So there is like, we, we sort of have a method for it that takes you through the steps really quick. So you can have, you know, if you're provided with the right research, uh, so if you, if you get some, you know, get some logs from like the live chat center, so you know what, what questions are coming in. If you do an interview with the marketing department, if you really get like the basic information around the company and, and your customers, and most companies can just provide you with that, uh, then you can sort of go through the steps in a day and have, you know, have a good understanding and have something to work with. Um, to sort of get the first interactions out there. But if you then you know, really turn it from like an experiment into, hey, we're doing this. Uh, then you want to sort of take that extra week and really make sure that you get it right. Mm. It is. There's there's a really interesting guy, um, Wally Brill. He's, oh, yeah. he worked, you know Wally Brill, yeah, from, from yeah. Google. <laughs> yeah, we work very closely with Wally. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've see, I seen a talk from him Um and it, I can't remember what event it was at. I think it might have been the Google event they had when they did yeah, the duplex the thing. Yeah, 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 I think yeah. It, was, it was like Matt last May, I think that was. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he was talking about the persona design for an airline pilot and stuff. And it was like, it was really, it was really interesting. And I'll put the links in the show notes um, if I can find it again. Um, one sec. Yeah, and it, it was so he was talking about this persona design. And I was thinking it, it sounded really, really good, and you could tell a clear difference between the two personas. Um, and at the time, I was kind of wondering whether Google kind of 
did that for the design of the assistant. I don't know if you've seen this, or whether you've seen it, Dustin, but um, it, there's a story that came out kind of over the week, which is on about, um, about by the time this comes out, it'll be a couple of weeks back. But um, so they, they've actually, so they, they did develop a backstory for um, Google Assistant and there's things in there um, around, you know, when she was a child, she won a hundred thousand pound on Jeopardy and like she's a, the, she's the daughter of like two doctors and, or a surgeon or something like that. And, like, so it's like, it's really interesting to, because when you know that backstory and you can see you can get into the minds of how they've kind of tried to position it and it does it does reflect in in the sort of tone and the personality of the yeah. of the thing yeah yeah i we uh, one of our designers a couple of days ago she came up with something like a little detail for a persona of a guy that i don't i don't remember the full story anymore but she had, in the biography of that character she had that little thing he always carries a swiss army knife <laughs> It's just in his pocket. Nobody sees it, but it's it's always there. I find that's like a brilliant, brilliant little detail. It's like it's like it's like that's that's really like knowing that sort of thing. That how silly it sounds. It's really what is going to create a good character. Having all that stuff around there, where you can feel, oh yeah, I, I know a guy that always carries that Swiss Army. He never <laughs> uses it. He always has it, and. It's, the little things that you know make it memorable and there's going to come a time when you write dialogue for that character where that detail is going to be spot on it's going to help you make a decision and i love that like having these characters the way wally did wally was on the persona team for the assistant for a long time and he's now a conversation design head of conversation design advocacy at google but yeah, he, he's really, uh, he was on the Persona team for a long time. Yeah, mm, yeah it is, it's interesting stuff. And it's, it's reminiscent of almost um, kind of creating like a screenplay or creating a, a film or, or writing for or creating a character for for some some kind of you know whether it's a sitcom or a film or a drama it's sort of reminiscent of that isn't it and there's a lot of stuff when we spoke about um we spoke uh around uh pull string and we had uh oren jacob of pull string you remember just in a few weeks back and he was talking about the differences between um kind of screen and voice first and obviously we've we've kind of talked about technology we've talked about psychology so i'm wondering whether we can tap into the copywriting side of things a little bit from your perspective what is the the kind of some of the differences between typical copywriting and then conversational copywriting yeah Uh, and i think you sort of gave the answer in that it's very similar to screenplay and and, uh, and and film and dialogue in novels. So if you look, I don't know who said that one. It's like it's stuck with me for years. I think it was like a simple YouTube video once. But someone says like, in a book when there's dialogue, it can ha- it can do three things. It can reveal character, move the plot forward, or something share something about the location where they're where they're at. And every sentence needs to sort of uh, check two or three. So if there is a sentence coming out, it needs to say something about the character and it needs to say something about uh, move the plot forward. And uh, the, the, so that, that's, that's one of the things that we use a lot and that every sentence needs to sort of have more than one function. Uh, that, that's a big one. That comes really from screenplaying and play, uh, uh, screenwriting and, uh, and novel writing. Uh, but also if you look at like a three act structure that, you know, it was originally identified by uh, Aristotle, where, you know, there is a start, there is a middle ground, and then there is a resolution. And in every, that, that three act is also part of every scene. So we always have two characters that want something in a scene, then they have a dialogue in which they sort of have to overcome obstacles. They're not understanding each other. They're not in sync or they have a different goal. They're trying to manipulate each other. And there's sort of like a battleground and obstacles to overcome to eventually come to a resolution. And when that happens, it's the end of the scene. Well, it's completely the same because if you have a, a bot that has, you know, a certain requirements that it wants to get out of the conversation but you also have a user that wants to get certain things out of that conversation then you have all the ingredients to create a a beautiful beautifully crafted dialogue 
um, that that's very polished and it is very similar to the way you know the way people speak in movies that's not how people talk you know but it sounds natural it's like it's like phony natural language um, and and it but it's it's polished it's crafted they spend you know weeks on on every sentence sometimes and it's it's very close to that where you have characters with a certain goal and they sort of use fake natural language to get there. Uh, and that creates tension, that creates engagement, that creates excitement. Um, so if you look at the traditional copywriter, like the, the real, like real old school uh, copywriters, they understand the psychology, right? They understand, you know, uh, all the anchoring and stuff like that. Um, but right now in the market, if you, if you get your typical copywriter, that's usually someone that has been writing blog posts for the last five years and then focusing on creating like seven ways of doing this and that. <laughs> now, what you'll quickly discover is that these guys really don't know how to write and they're not – all they've learned is, is that structure of creating a blog post. And they could sure they can put like two three sentences together, but they don't understand the uh, the craft of, of really – giving every word some love and attention, like what the real writer does. Um, so, so that's really unique. So what we've learned is that like the real blog post writers or the uh, search engine optimization guys, uh, they're not that useful. Um, so you want, we have a lot of like, you know, people that want to write novels that just graduated that haven't been ruined by, companies that are still you know very eager to learn but they do know how to write they know how to sit there and make something come to life uh these are the guys that that we can use and and, and we can train them to become conversation designers uh, the best guys are really the the people that want to be a writer they write every night and as a side job they're doing customer service those guys mm -hmm. are perfect because they're used to sort of diving into systems and solving issues and looking stuff up and then, you know, having fun with words and, and actually making that customer feel better and helping them solve an issue. So if you got people that want to be a writer, during your studies they worked in customer service and they haven't been ruined by a company yet, <laughs> then those are the ones that the, those are the ones that you need. So it's it's really you gotta learn how to you have passion for writing and make stuff come to life and you know have, have thick skin that's also obviously because you gotta got every writer will know that like you gotta go through those couple of years where you gotta you know create thick skin and because you're gonna get everybody has an opinion on text yeah uh because we all because we all know how to type we all think that we know how to write uh but those are two completely different things <laughs> uh, a real writer you know gets criticized by people that have no idea what they're talking about but uh yeah so if you're like, like copywriting those, those are really like the skills that that you know you gotta sort of really understand the context of the user really understand how to you know show don't tell make it come to life uh and so we usually we, we have these writers that are not afraid of of technology and then we teach them more uh, psychology so a lot of them will be using certain principles from psychology but they're not that aware of it mm. uh, so we, we really spend a lot of time training that so we sort of break down their training skills and give them new like a new toolkit to use that it's going to allow them to sort of build stuff from the ground up so what what it sounds like is we're going to have a a lot of creative writing graduates go back and say, Mom, Dad, I told you my degree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, exactly. It's true. It, what, what you're saying is true, though. I, I, I did um, a bit of freelance writing for a couple of years, a few years back. And I remember the very first time, because I used to write, you know, I was doing my blog every every day or whatever, and I was kind of like trying to find some sort of like thing on the side. And I remember the very first time I ever actually wrote for a client, and I sent them the draft, thinking it was finished, thinking that it was done, thinking it was fine. And then it was oh, published, no. and I read it, and I thought... That's not what I wrote. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, they've changed the intro. They've, they've kind of, but obviously it's gone through the editing process. They've changed it to reflect their brand and it's kind of changed. But at the time I was thinking, what was wrong with that? You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Now you gotta, you gotta, that's why you gotta sort of 
learn, you know, break everything down and learn, teach people to do everything very consciously and have arguments for everything because that allows them to defend it to the teeth. Because right now, like every conversation designer that was sort of, you know, uh, uh, that we're allowing to work with a company, then, you know, there's so many strong forces because right now everyone that's involved with a voice project, it's usually like the managers that, you know, are, are trying to make a case within the company. Uh, so there's a lot of pressure on them. And, but they don't have the skill set yet, but they do have strong opinions and they want it to succeed. So they're very, you know, uh, forward with their critique and their feedback. Maybe not always for the right reason, or for the right reasons, but not having the you know the skill sets to to actually be giving that feedback. So as a conversation designer, you need to have an argument for everything that you do, because that allows you to sort of keep your copy alive. Because otherwise, it's going to get butchered and you're going to go the safe way, and you're going to end up with like a, a flowchart type design uh, that's just going to sound like an automated uh, call center thing, right? You know, mm -hmm. press one for this or say, uh, press yeah. say two for that. Exactly. You know, so I think that that's an important one. You really need to be very aware and, and very careful about everything that you do and have arguments for every sentence that you put out there. Mm. You must, uh, you must have been experienced in this, Dustin, have you with your book? Oh uh, yeah. I had a little bit. Uh, first <laughs> of all, my editors are pretty good and they, they are a little hands off, but, uh, but yeah. Uh, every time you write, uh, people are people are critics, uh, for sure. But I want to go back to something you said, which is that every sentence should uh, reveal the character and fancy action. Uh, this is uh, something uh, Kurt Vonnegut uh, was the one who originally said this, and I went uh, and looked it up really quickly, and he's he's got these eight rules for writing fiction, but I was surprised how much most of the rules were applicable to conversation design as well. Mm. For example, the first one is to use the time of a total stranger in such a way that he or she will not feel the time was wasted. I feel like that's a, it's a perfect encapsulation. <laughs> yeah. what supposed to do, right? Uh, and essentially just every sentence really needs to, every sentence, every word needs to really fight for its survival. Uh, if you're writing, like you said, it's gotta have a purpose. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's also uh, Elmer Leonard also has like a little list, I think of like 10 rules for writing. And most of it also applies to conversation design. And the most important one, if it sounds written, rewrite it. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, yeah, that, but that's also like one of the basic things for every writer. Just read your stuff out loud. And then if it sounds shitty, you know that it's not good. But somehow we're like, so happy to get it done or something that we just ship it and that's just really bad <laughs> <laughs> unless you're really experienced and then you can sort of break the rules and sort of because you, you'll know what it sounds like but there's like little things like it's really fundamental writing rules that apply so I, I think it's not always necessarily like a new way of writing but it's really a medium or channel that is going to show who are the good writers and who are not mm. And it's it's mad because it's kind of in terms of to create something. It's very similar to like a website, isn't it? You know, like everyone kind of puts a lot of focus on a website looking good, but most of the actions happening behind the scenes anyway. But it's it's the look that gets the credit sort of thing. Whereas this is this is kind of similar in a sense that there's a lot of action going on behind the scenes, but essentially the words are all you have. You know, that's literally all you have is the words that, that you end up with. So it's kind of like, although in the context of this podcast and in the context generally, we talk about all these other things that surround it. Um, but when it comes down to the actual copy, that's, it's literally all you've got. So it needs to be absolutely spot on, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, exactly. Like you say, it's all you got. And that's why you can also, you know, what we talked about earlier with, you know, making use of the stereotypes, the way the brain is wired, you know, make use of that because there's nothing that can repair it as well, right? It's not like if it's a website that someone get loose or lost, there's like a button that sort of brings you home and you can start again. But with voice, yeah, you can say start the conversation again, mm -hmm. but that that's not a good experience. So mm. every, you need to think everything through and you need to use like little tricks 
make use of, of just the, the human brain and manipulate that and, and you know also for the user's interest and uh, you know be, be creative in, in taking shortcuts and, and you know I have one company it's like oh that's also like so silly it's a bit off topic now but uh, but it, it goes back to the technology question we had earlier is that uh, you know how many rooms are in your house? A lot of people will then say, oh, there's the living room, there's the bedroom, there's the kitchen, there's the hallway. Um, and for them, the way to deal with that problem, because you obviously your your uh, bot is expecting a number to the question how many rooms are there. Mm. Uh, so what they would do is they were busy creating complete lists of type of rooms that someone might have uh, and then keeping track of those and then adding them up and saying, ah, so that would then be six rooms. Uh, so that takes a developer about a week, uh, <laughs> as opposed to saying, you know, if, uh, if someone says how many rooms are there in the house, oh, there's the living room, there's the kitchen, there's the bedroom. Okay, so how many rooms would you say that are? And, you know, that, yeah. Like having that little sentence in there is going to solve your whole problem, <laughs> right? So it's, it's understanding how text works and not being afraid and making use of everything. Like uh, it's so, so tempting to, to find a, a tech solution for that problem. Mm. But just write better and understand how the words influence the user. Yeah. Fantastic. Hans, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. That was such an interesting conversation. Where can people find out more about Robocopy and where can they go to, to sign up to the course? Yes. Uh, so what they should do is go to conversationalacademy.com. So that, um, let me say that again because I, <laughs> I started that again. Uh, so yeah, just go to conversationalacademy.com or robocopy.io. Uh, those are the two places where you can find us. Uh, you can just reserve your seat for the webinar series right now. And then we're soon launching a video course where our people can self-study and really become certified conversation designers. Uh, and also, you know, we're at a lot of conferences, so just go there and hang out with us and get to know us. And uh, we're always open to talking to future conversation designers. <laughs> Fantastic. Hans, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a great talk. That was Hans Van Dam. Hans, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of VUX World. That was such an interesting episode, getting into the the kind of like nuts and weeds of the of, of conversational design. That was there was things in there that I wasn't expecting to be in there around psychology. So you know, I'll mention the book uh, uh, Nudge and I'll put it in the show notes. It's a fast, fascinating book, and I've used a lot of that practices in terms of communication design. You know, with with letters and with um, with web design and things like that um, and it, it is proven you know, every single project I've worked on the way we've incorporated some of this kind of like behavior change kind of psychology it, it has been proven to work it's really interesting but I never thought about translating it into the voice space it is it's uh, you know framing the conversation right using anchoring and and social proof and all that kind of stuff is really really interesting stuff and then I was loving what he was saying around getting users started. So if it's going to be something like a train ticket booking, or I'm using that example all the time, but if it's going to be something that's going to require you to get a lot of information from people, then starting off with a few yes questions to break them into the routine is a really, really good idea. I love the concept of that. It's similar to form design on, on, on a website. You know, you want to get, if someone's, for example, making a complaint or if they're, if they're, they're try, kind of like, uh, you know, trying to order something or whatever, you want to get them to do the, the bit first that's going to get them committed so if they're going to complain about something then you want to get them to put the complaint in first because if they've gone through the process of putting that down on paper then the next few fields around putting the addresses in and call you know contact details are not going to be a problem because they've already invested in the time and invested in, in, in kind of telling you their issue similar to sort of train that's probably why you end up picking your train uh, your kind of like your location and your dates and your seat options and all that first is because you, you've then committed to getting that most important bit done and you're invested in the process and then when you need to put your credit card details in you need to put your contact details in you might need to set up an account or whatever all of that's less of a problem because you've invested so much anyway so that's a really interesting uh really interesting way of, of incorporating that kind of stuff into voice i love that and then uh, even down to the bits around uh around 
the technology so narrowing the use case that's a common thing it's coming up all the time and also on the copywriting side such an interesting way of thinking in terms of relating the copywriting similar to a screenplay and then how your persona is important um interesting interesting stuff there's there's bags and bags of insight in there i think that you know if you went through this podcast uh with a pen and a pad in fact i should probably get the transcripts done but it's probably a bit too late in the day for that but uh yes there's, there's just so much in there you can learn so do check out the course conversationalacademy.com do check out robo copy uh thank you hans for joining us that was an immense conversation thank you dustin for co-hosting and as ever and most importantly thank you all for listening until next time see you later